I just feel like teaching this morning. <clears throat> they never too early. Never too early. Never too early. What's going on, y'all? <clears throat> I just feel like teaching this morning. Can I teach this morning? Can I teach? What's going on, Mario? I just feel like teaching this morning about what's up. What's up, Mario? Mario, you up anyway? <laughs> what's up, Sean? I just feel like teaching this morning. Mm -hmm. What's up, Kenny Ray? You're probably on duty right now. Be safe out there. I know you always gonna be safe. I know it's not anything to worry about, but still, be safe. You always gonna be safe. What's up, Sarah? What's up, Mike? How are you? What's up, Jess? <clears throat> What's up, Jess? You know, I was watching the video. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I'm not looking for a large turnout, but if we get a large turnout, that's cool. That's cool. That is cool. Brenninger versus United States, 338 U.S. 160, 1949. So if you want to know part of my process, you said you just you just getting off? Yeah, I know. I don't know how that part is because you work a different thing as well as, you know, what you do. And uh, the straight, I think, what is it, 20, 2448, something like that? 2448? Uh, was it 24 on 48 off? Something like that? Oh my God. I don't know. But, I, but then it's what you're doing in your 24 hours too. So, and in Chicago, that could be a lot of shit. So, <laughs> yeah, they're like 24 hours in a suburban shift. It's different, I'm sure. I don't even have to know. And know. Yeah, 24 72. Okay. All right. All right. You get it. Um, so. <clears throat> I think that sometimes people don't, this is just a conversation and that's what we're having. This is just a conversation, uh, but it's needed to be had. I think that usually in these use of force cases or in cases involving the criminal justice system, um, sometimes it's a pick a side and I probably argue most times it's a pick a side. You're either on the side of the police or the justice system, right? Or you're either on the side of the person who was, you know, uh, um, dealt with, right? Either shot, stabbed, you know, hopefully not stabbed in a police situation, but you get what I'm saying. You know, shot, tased, you know, battered, sprayed, stuff like that. Um, instead of looking at things from both sides you know and that is something that's important to do is look at it from both sides why is it important to look at it from both sides it's important to look at it from both sides because there are lessons to be had on both sides you know as it relates to uh the george floyd situation absolutely positively no way should that officer have applied the restraint like that in that manner, okay? Um, but that's not to just outright just state that restraints should never be applied in that manner. And I want to look at um, Harvey's mayor, Christopher, I almost called him Columbus, that's not his name, Christopher Clark. Uh, Christopher Clark. They just uh, enacted, or he just pushed out an executive order prohibiting neck restraints to be used except in the use of deadly force, where the officer has grounds to believe that you know deadly force is imminent and he needs to use it to protect himself or others. So really, I thought it was a publicity thing uh, when I saw what he did, because I'm like, well, that's what the standard is anyway so you're not rewriting anything you're not making something new that's the standard right and uh 
Harvey's mayor, Christopher Clark, even said it. And this is Harvey, Illinois. Uh, Christopher Clark even, uh, he said, uh, no, it wasn't him. I'm sorry. It was the chief of police, Rob Collins, uh, who said, uh, I don't remember in the academy them ever teaching uh, neck restraints. I'm like, how long has it been since you've been in the academy? It's been a long time. When I went through the academy, uh, and I think, Kenny, you were either right with or sometime after me. Uh, they taught that. <laughs> they absolutely taught that. It's called a vascular, uh, I think a, a vaso, I think it's vasoconstriction. It's a neck restraint. They taught that in PPCT. Uh, and it's taught for the use of deadly force. Like if you're in a, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat type situation or you're on the ground, you know, and in that situation, you know, uh, you, you can't get to your firearm and maybe your firearm has been taken or you don't have access to your taser and you really feel like you're about to die, you know, uh, and you need to get about the, get out that situation. It's pretty much wrestling in, this, in essence, but it's a more violent kind of it where you get yourself into a position of advantage and then you use that to not necessarily uh, kill the person, so to speak, but you can, you know, cause that person to pass out. And if it results in their death, well, then deadly force was authorized at that time. Uh, and Heather, you even said not all states teach neck restraints. Yeah, well, then that, that's, that's on them. But to just give a blanket statement of ignorance is really telling and really showing of uh, not necessarily Rob, because uh, Chief Collins is a former Marine DI, more, former Marine, former drill instructor. So he gets the use of force. He gets it. But, you know, when, you, when you're the chief of police, you are subject to the, you are uh, at the will and pleasure of the mayor. So you don't really have an opinion. You have the mayor's opinion, which then becomes your official opinion. And that's some um, right. Nothing against Rob, nothing against the chief. Just pointing out some uh, some things because I do pay attention to, you know, a, a lot of these conversations and stuff like that. So I think that you miss uh, perspective of the lessons, the lessons that could be had when you look at things from an emotional perspective or a non-emotional perspective. Uh, not saying we want to disqualify your emotions. Your emotions are very qualified, very qualified. You're entitled to your feelings. You know, we are the collection of our education and experiences. And with that come how you feel about the situation, especially if you haven't been trained how to suppress those feelings. So when we look at the George Floyd situation, right? Yes, the neck restraint was not something that should have been applied at that time. Okay. But Let's look at the, the road less traveled, right? The road less traveled. It is ever more a greater frequency in a percentage, if not a great percentage of these cases where the road less traveled is looking at the situation that made such an illegal or unauthorized use of force possible. We don't look at that. We don't look at that. But not for the call but not for the action. Let me back up just a little bit more. But not for the action that spawned the call that brought the police there. Would this have happened? I think that's a very valid question to ask. When we look at the situation in Atlanta, right? And, and uh, Rob Penskis, he uh, talked, it was another situation he was trying to get me to look at. And I looked at it too. It was a situation in uh, Georgia, uh, um, where um, the state police ended up shooting someone who tried to run over uh, the officer. That's another thing we could talk about M more at a later time because I didn't dive too much into it. I got just a gist of it, but not to digress. Uh, when we look at the situation with uh, Mr. Rashad Brooks in uh, Atlanta in the Wendy's drive through you all already know my position if you follow me on these things, right? You already know that I felt that <clears throat> um, while I do understand, in essence, certain things, there could have been a different choice of the use of force that was used at that time. Uh, or even, not, I'm sorry, strike that, not the use of force. Prior to that situation that made the use of force possible, that's my opinion, is that, you know, it's a DUI, yes, he's drunk, but there were other options that could have been taken. Now, some people tried to inject and I'm digressing just a little bit because it's on my mind. Some people try to inject that, well, some department's policies don't permit officers to have certain levels of discretion that could uh, uh, 
come out or turn out of you know in a in a more nonviolent situation. And if that's the case, I then argue that these police officers need to stop, in essence, lockstepping and following uh, orders, in essence, that would put them in situations where the department can dump them. Does that make sense? You know, officers have the voice, have the, you know, togetherness, if you will, uh, to be able to refuse certain orders and make certain requests like, hey, boss, look, I see you got this policy that says this, and not just me, but we are backed, right? Here's where police unions can become strong, right? Police unions can become even stronger when they do what the members want uh, to be done. And if the police officers come together and say that this policy will make it where it takes away our discretion that we need on the field. The bosses wrote, wrote this policy. They wrote it from an office. They don't work the streets. It's been a long time since they strapped up stuff. They are just so out of touch with working on the streets with boots on the ground. We need the members by a voice vote, collective vote, whatever, to sit here and in this policy, we need this to be changed because I can see it in a situation where we go on ahead and respond to this and we are forced, we're forced by policy under duress because we don't want to lose our jobs. We are forced to take an action that we know is going to result in a, a bad outcome. And I want to be able to say in a DUI, yes, we should take these folks off the streets because there's so many folks that that, that drive drunk and they, and they kill innocent people people. Oh my God, it's horrible. But then there are some times, then there are some times where, yeah, there's those, there's those, those technicals, right? Yeah. Okay. You're, you're drunk, but you're in your drive through, right? Or your driveway, you're drunk and yeah, you're, you know, uh, you didn't kill anybody. You didn't, you know, we just happened upon you, right? You went out and you had a good time. You pulled over, right? You're on this side of the road. I do a investigative stop, not necessarily a traffic stop. I just see this car on the side of the road. I do an investigative stop and I happen upon you. You're not fighting me. You're being nice, drunk and nice, right? But you're being nice, right? And, oh shit, it's this policy. Damn, I already called it down, right? They know I'm here. I ran your plate. They know you're, you see what I'm saying? And so now I got to arrest you. It, it, some of these policies got to change. And you got some smart cops in the department. You got some dumb ones too, because we're going to talk about that in a minute, right? But you got some smart cops in the department who would love to say something. But what does that saying something do? That saying something gets you fired. Hello, I have been in those situations. I, look, my blessing and my curse is my mouth. And Kenny Ray, you know, <laughs> you know that to be the case. My blessing and my curse is my mouth because I don't have not one doggone problem telling the chief, telling my uh, lieutenants, telling my sergeants, no, I'm not doing that. That doesn't make sense. You're going to put me in a situation where you're going to have to can me. You're going to have to bag me. Well, Mike, if you don't do it, I'm going to have to tell the chief. Good. And make sure you give him my full name and my description and the weather at the time and how I even smelled when I said it because I'm not going to do it. And I know I'm going to be fired. I don't care. I don't care. Right? I, I don't care. You don't have to like it. Fuck your rank. Excuse the language. I know y'all might have had a kid watching, right? I don't care, right? And it's not, it's not insubordination because I want to buck against the rules. No, 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 no. There's different class. There's a, another classification of insubordination. <laughs> Is it kidding? There you go. There's, there's another classification of insubordination. It's being smart enough to know and be able to see beyond the forest, right? So when we analyze this Atlanta situation, right? You said the smartest thing to do is to follow the rules. Why have rules if you're not going to follow them? You must have just got in, Samantha. I'll, I'll keep 
lecturing, maybe you'll catch on. You know, the thing is, is that uh, you got you distracted me with that. I was going somewhere. Damn, I got to get back to it. Um, there's there's healthy insubordination. There's that insubordination where you know this thing to be wrong and you're willing to accept the risk of not following that order, right? You're willing to accept the risk of not following that order. Yes, not following that order could get me fired. Okay, I can always get another job, right? Not following that order could even get me vilified. Okay, I can always go somewhere and I'll be okay. Well, not following that order can get you ostracized from this department. Okay, I can always recover. I have never seen a headline in any media. And I'm not saying the media is the best or the worst. It is what it is. It's a private institution that gets itself on ratings. You know, it's, it's what it is, right? But I've never seen a headline officer fired for failing to shoot black man. All right? You might have seen a little segment. He didn't see no major headline we're seeing it. We're reporting live at the scene of the police station where an officer lost his job today because he was fired for not shooting a black man. You never seen that. You just you just haven't seen that, right? And so what about the yeah, you can come home alive. You know, what about the road less you gotta do an officer today? What about that road less traveled? Right? Okay, so. That's for the officer's part. Now, what about the road less travel for Mr. Rashad, right? Come on, you drunk behind the wheel, right? You couldn't find somebody else to drive. You couldn't find an Uber, right? You couldn't find an Uber, you know? And so there's that part right there, the road less travel. That's why it's important to look at things from both sides, both sides, both sides. Yeah, what made this call possible? You seen it? Officer fired for failing to use lethal force. I'm talking about major headline, like George Floyd isk world nationwide headline. You see what I'm saying? Headline. That's what I'm talking about. Hair headline, right? Something that because I haven't seen it. I mean, I, I have seen it, but not in that context, right? <laughs> or not to that degree. That's what I should have said. Not to that degree. Uh so what about the other side though? The road less traveled. We we need to we need to, you know, look at both sides. We need to look at both sides. And I think that's very important because the lessons are lost in that. Um, moving on, moving on. So I watched yesterday's uh, press conference with Mayor Lightfoot. Yeah, I know, fighting with two cops. We, we know that too, right? We know that too. Taking his taser, you know. And on to that. Okay, let me let me backtrack. Just this little small point. Can I say this little small point? This little small point? Here we go. Um, it's amazing how in, <laughs> and some of you all are wondering like, oh my God, Mike, this is a situation where clearly we're talking about Georgia, not George Floyd, uh, but we're talking about the, uh, which is in Minneapolis, we're talking about the drive through situation again with Rashad Brooks, I believe that's his name. Uh, we're talking about, oh my God, Mike, I can't see how you don't see that a person running with a taser can then turn around and then shoot that taser and then it not be seen as a reason to use force. Okay, I submit to you this. A taser is only considered a firearm by operation because of the needle that punctures the canister of gas where that release of those you know, gases propel the taser projectiles. That's why it's considered a firearm. Other than that, by every law in every state, check me if I'm wrong, I might be, I don't know. But in Illinois, I know this to be certain that a taser is not considered a deadly force instrument. Ah, wait, hold on you sports fans. In Illinois, and I would argue to say probably in Georgia, right, in Illinois, a taser is not considered a deadly force instrument. It is not considered a deadly force instrument. It is considered to be an instrument that is designed. It's by design. It is designed to disable 
or control an individual without creating the likelihood of causing death or great bodily harm. And by that very fact, it cannot be considered when used by the police as a tool likely to cause death or great bodily harm. If we go to, I'm just going to spit Illinois law, because if you've read all the laws in the states, there's only small wording that is tweaked. They are pretty much all the same. They are pretty much all the same. And so, 720 ILCS Act 5, Section 7-1, in use of force in defense of person, right? In defense of one's person, a person is justified in the use of force against another when and to the extent that he reasonably believes that such conduct is necessary to defend himself against such other's imminent use of unlawful force. However, he is justified in the use of force which is intended or likely to cause death or great bodily harm only if he reasonably believes that such force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself or another or to prevent the commission of a forcible felony. Okay? That having been said, an officer's use of an instrument that is designed to disable or control an individual without creating the likelihood of causing death or great bodily harm is not considered force likely to cause death or great bodily harm. Now, can the taser cause death or great bodily harm? Absolutely, but it is not by design designed to do that. If I were the prosecutor, Against that police officer, I would go to his training record. Specifically, his taser training record, right? And I would bring in the taser instructor. I used to be one, right? And I would talk about, no, nah, maybe. Nice try, Brooke, but ain't gonna work, right? Because if you look at the reports, he uh, probably will be charged. I don't know if he's going to be charged or not. But if you look at the reports, right, I guarantee, I guarantee the theft of that taser was ever most in his mind when he decided to chase after that person. And when he decided to use force, he could argue, he could argue that the taser could have disabled me. And in a close quarters situation, you're right. But this wasn't a close quarters situation. And that taser has a limitation. That taser is limited to the distance of the capacity of the cart. Strike that. To the distance of the propulsion of the cartridges. The cartridges that he had were 25 foot cartridges. And the optimal performance range is 7 to 15 feet. The maximum effective distance or the maximum distance is 25 feet. And so, there could have been other options. We look at Tennessee versus Gardner. Tennessee versus Gardner. In Tennessee versus Gardner, absolutely, Jess, yes. In Tennessee versus Gardner, Tennessee versus Gardner talks about the fleeing felon rule. And I get it, right? So, <laughs> and this was funny, this was stupid, this was stupidly funny, right? So, some people try to introduce information regarding Mr. Brooks's or not Mr. Brooks, Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. Yeah. Maybe Mr. Brooks, Rashad's background, right? He was a parolee that was released from prison because of COVID-19. He had done this. He had done that. He had done this and that, and this and this and that and that. And on top of that, he had did this. And of all the things that he had did, had did, right? <laughs> That's why he was shot. He was a felon. He was a good for not a criminal. Okay, 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 I get it. Let's let's bring it down. Let's bring it down. Okay. First of all, Brenninger versus United States, 330, was it 338 US 160, 1949. Okay, I'll say it again. Brenninger versus United States, 338 US 160, 1949. We deal with probabilities, right? This is the case law in the United States Supreme Court that established the theory or the rule of probable cause. We deal with probabilities, facts and circumstances known to the officer 
at the time of the action, not what you found out later. At the time, at the time, at the time, not what you found out later. Well, toxicology said that he had he was hyped up on methamphetamines, and you know the crazy piece. Stop. You did not know that at the time of the arrest. Now you could articulate behaviors displayed and what it's likely to lead to, but you cannot then say that those behaviors are indicative of someone on a specific substance that you found out later in autopsy. Because some behaviors are displayed in multiple substances that a person can consume and be under the influence of, right? Not every drunk is aggressive. Not every drunk is nice. Not every person on methamphetamine goes around and starts killing folks, right? So what if anything that you know at the time of that action, okay, at the time of that action, then, pushing forward, right, if in fact you knew, because it could have been the case that this officer knew this particular person, because that does happen, right? If in fact that's the case, then that would have been all the more reason to exercise a great deal of caution when trying to apprehend him. Because you have more than enough reason to believe that as a parolee, he may not want to go back to jail. So you could have had more units on the scene. You could have used time and carefully chosen words, right? But let's talk about just a little small smidgen because I do want to move on to the Chicago situation. We're not going to, I'm going to make good use of this time. Let's look at the insensitivity of these officers, all of you all watch me. Put yourself in the shoes as a chief of police. Congratulations. I have just won the election and I've just made you chief of police. Put on your third or fourth star. Congratulations. You get to run your town of what the heck department. Okay? You're the chief of police. How insensitive are these officers to not be cognizant or aware of what's going on at the time, right now, before this stop, right now. We are trying to calm down in, a, in as much as we can. The f Here we go, okay. We are trying to calm down right now as much as we can. The flames. The flames of rioting. Am I still here? Are y'all still here? I know it froze. It froze for a minute. Can you all still see me? Now, give me some thumbs, a couple thumbs. Say something if you can still see me. I'll keep going. This moment has been brought to you today by Arizona Iced Tea. If you're thirsty, sip. That's not the commercial. I just said that shit. You can see me. Somebody said I froze. Am I still here? And there's always a delay too, I reckon. Okay, so I am still here. All right. So, how insensitive? How? I don't have T Mobile. Don't, uh uh. <laughs> I don't have T Mobile. Y'all got T Mobile. I don't have T Mobile. But I did take out the charger right here so it doesn't overheat while I'm teaching. Hey, what's going on? All right, so, how insensitive? How insensitive are these police officers to the point where you're not paying attention to the climate of what's going on right now? How insensitive. You see that the nation is, in essence, trying to calm down the rioting, trying to calm down the looting, trying to calm down what's going on so we can have the theater for what could be conversation. The theater for what could be change, right? And how insensitive are you to not take into consideration 
the arguments or the 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 mindset of have to arrest versus want to arrest. New theory. Have to, well, not new theory to really, but just maybe I'm making this up, right? Have to arrest versus want to arrest. Have to arrest means who is the aggrieved party in this? Is it just the people of the state or are there some, the people and some victims, right? Somebody died. So yes, we got to take you into custody because you got to answer for that because a death was involved, right? That's a have to arrest, right? Want to arrest, ah, yeah, you did break the law. For sure. Yeah, you, you're definitely drunk. I can put you through SFSTs. <laughs> I don't even go through all that. I'm going to go to maximum deviation with horizontal gaze and nystagmus. Your eyes are going to be jumping higher than a stack of kids in a freaking jumping house. It's going to go, right? I know this to be the case. The odor of alcohol is emanating not only from your breath, but from your freaking pores. I know I'm going to get this arrest. But what's the outcome that could happen? Well, buddy, I'm white. And you're black. These are obvious facts. Some of you are like, well, Mike, I thought what race didn't have anything to do with it. Shut up and go with me. I'm white. You're black. The good side of this stop is, sure, you comply. You take it to the station. Get you to blow into the intoxilizer. Get a point. Something, 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 something. Well over point oh eight. Okay, give you a ticket. And then you'll go on ahead and come to court. But that's not going to stop you from after getting that ticket, after going through that stuff, it's not going to stop you from going out there and getting a car and killing someone again. So for those of you all who said, we got to take this absconder off the streets and we got to give them a ticket. We got to give them their day in court because they're driving under the influence and take, you notice his finger, right? This is the finger of resolute and taking them off the streets is going to ensure that they don't drive again. It's going to ensure that we save lives. You don't know that after that arrest, they don't carjack a car and then kill someone else. Get a car from a friend around the corner and kill someone else. Get a car from wherever and kill someone else. You, you, you don't know these. these. These are not things that you can control either. Right? But you can control certain things. I'm a white guy. You're a black guy. Right now, it's a F the police world, right? Whatever. And I'm a police officer and you're uh, whomever you are. Let's we'll just say a good guy, right? If I arrest you, the bad side of that, <laughs> yes, Larry, the finger of resolute, <laughs> right? If you look at the bad side of that, Missy, the bad side is you could not comply. And that does happen in your drunk driving stops. Because remember, they don't have inhibitions. They've lost that. They've lost that for that moment. And if you come off aggressive, some will return that aggression back to you, right? And so let's find a different way to bring about a positive resolution where all parties in this case, in this case, not in all cases, but in this case, let's bring about a positive resolution where I don't run the risk of possibly losing my job over something that was, okay, yes, yeah, a call of you being drunk and a doggone Wendy's. You ain't killed nobody. You hadn't hurt nobody. Let's just go on ahead and put you in the station and then just have you sleep it off. Tow your car for sure so that you don't get to drive this car, not another car, this car, right? And let you sleep it off. Oh, but Mike, but policy doesn't allow that. Oh, policy doesn't allow that. Policy doesn't also allow for you to cover for your brother and sister officer either. But we do it. Shh. And so what's good for the goose has to then be good for the gander. Shh. Let's move on. Here we go. Let's travel with us to Chicago, where we are now. Okay. I saw the uh, press conference with Mayor Lightfoot, uh, and with <laughs> and with Mayor Lightfoot. Um, okay, stop, Neil. You are right. Jess Jones. A taser couldn't be used to immobilize an officer. Okay, that was said in sarcasm. Yeah, that could, but in close quarters. Neil, that could, Neil Wright says, a taser couldn't be used to immobilize an officer while the criminal steals his real gun. Yes, he's, and he said that in sarcasm. Yes, that could happen, but in close quarters. 
Rashad was running away. So there's your close quarters argument. The further the distance that he's running, the less effective that taser is to that officer. Bad argument on your part. Let's move on. In Chicago, Mayor Lightfoot uh, brought out this ribbon team of uh, people who are going to somehow, you know, it's a police accountability. Let's solve the issue of systemic racism in police departments working group. Okay. And so you have the alderman and you had uh, some other folks and then another lady that came up there and she she was speaking so fast for the interpreter. I think that the unsung hero in that press conference was the interpreter. I've never seen so much American Sign Language and what could be gang signs at that press conference. It could have been he was just going at it and it could have been all kinds of, you know, he was, at, he was working so fast because she was just talking so fast and to the point where they had to switch out interpreters after him. He was working his butt off. Nevertheless... I think that this working group, which was supposed to be or is supposed to be a working group of people who are going to analyze use of force policy within the Chicago Police Department, they're going to analyze uh, some stops and things of that nature, uh, and they're going to come up with some solutions um, that are going to supposedly bring about some positive change. Um, I don't think that it's going to happen. And let me tell you why. Um, one, the thing about when politicians, and not all politicians fit this bill. I'm going to say that caveat. Not all politicians fit this bill. But when certain politicians do things, they pick, it is likely, that they pick the people who are sycophants. That's a fancy word to say, kiss butt, right? And so, why do they pick people that will more likely than not agree with their positions? Because any type of initiatives that are done are initiatives that are vote-based, they're vote based. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because people like to love what they hear. They don't want to learn from what they've heard. Right. And so if I get somebody on the team like a like or worse than a Mike Brown who will sit there and tell the mayor that, ma'am, um, you got your police, you got your community elements, right? You got your people who are, you know, upset and stuff like that and lost, you know, lost someone to gun violence and things like that. But then you put them on the panel instead of just having their opinion be a part of the analysis. I'll say it again. You put them on the panel, which means that their solutions are are not likely to be objective. They are definitely likely to be emotionally subjective. And I heard this lady and she was just going, and I'm not saying this lady because I'm only saying that because I don't know her name, okay? Um, but she's just going, 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 going. There's no real rhyme or reason to what, there's reason, but there's no rhyme to what she's saying. And she's just going, 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 going. And it's filled with emotion. And if rightful emotion, I'm not, I'm not disqualifying her emotion. She has a right to feel the way she does. And it's bona fide. Okay? But when you look at insanity, and Albert Einstein said it best, that, Albert, that insanity is repeating the same action and expecting a different outcome, then I argue or I ask you this. What is emotional insanity? Emotional insanity is where you're definitely repeating the same action and you're about to be pissed at the result that you are not going to get. 
Now, you are correct, Missy, and you have said this not only once, but twice, but three times, and you are correct, Missy. Emotions are necessary. Yes, they are, because it brings passion to your point, but your point must be, be there so that it, that point, that logical point can be impassioned. If you don't have logic behind your points, the passion will see through, but the point will be missed. I speak with passion. I speak with emotion. But I also have education that is infused on top of that. The logic must be there first so that the passion can display or teach without passion. My, hey, let me talk to you about Graham versus Connor. Let's talk about Tennessee versus Gardner. Let's talk about chapter 720 on the compiled statutes, Act 5, section 7-1. And once personal defense, a person is justified in the use of force. Yeah, that would be without passion. All monotone. That sucks. I want to, I don't want to be in that class. That would, that would be horrible, Right? But you got to have education with that passion. You got to have that. Because I'd rather be silent and be thought of as a fool than to speak out with passion and remove all doubt. A, imp <laughs> a passionate fool is worse to listen to. Come on, I don't want to listen to because you haven't captured me. I've listened to people who I may not necessarily care for because I love a good speech that is logical. I love a good speech that is passionate, that reaches to the hearts and minds of the points that you are trying to make that may get me to change whatever opinion I may hold. Yeah, Kenny Ray, you're right. It reminds me of a biology. Let's talk about chlorophyll and the tetrahydrocannabinol and the what? <laughs> yes, I just said THC. That's the cop stuff. You get it. But, you know, in that panel, okay, let, let's, let's get off the emotions and let's get back to the panel. In that panel, you have these golden gooses of people who, if they said a difference of opinion, they would be subject to some kind of punishment, right? You got the, you got a, a deputy chief from that area, right? If the deputy chief says something the mayor doesn't want to hear, the deputy chief is going to be in some trouble, right? If you look at some of the other folks on there, if you look at the other folks on there and they say something, they're going to be in trouble. So I also noticed one more thing, too. They had the uh, police. They had somebody from the community. They had a couple of other uh, uh, 21. It was supposed to be 21 folks, 21 folks, a working group who was selected, selected to give these opinions. But I noticed they don't have no social, uh, no, 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 uh, no, what am I trying to say? Social working component in that, right? All this talk of fixing the police, all this talk of fixing the police and very little talk about fixing the conditions or the people within these households that makes police intervention possible all this talk about fixing the police because they are the actors within the system and no talk whatsoever about fixing the social conditions right no talk about fixing and i'm not talking about you can talk about your re well let's give them good schools let's give them more community centers let's give them more Peace centers, sure, whatever you want to title it as. Let's give them more buildings. Let's give them more things, right? You can have a building, but if you don't have the motivated people to work in that, towards that progress. If you don't have people who are willing to say, yes, you need change, but those three fingers that come back in me shows that I need change. I could have did this better. I could have did that better, right? No look at the fingers towards us that would make these situations possible. The but not for argument tends to reign supreme. That is the least looked at. You could be a good person, but you could be a bad parent and your bad parenting could have made the next 
victim of police violence or victim of community violence because we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about that. And like I said yesterday, I was on Fox News yesterday. Fox 32 News. Like I said yesterday, if we don't have an honest conversation, an honest conversation about both sides, there's going to be some tears that's going to need to be shed. Son, I look, I apologize for not knowing my rights enough to be able to teach you how to know your rights, to be able to teach you how to act so that this situation where that use of force that may not have been the best course of action, officer. But I was wrong, too, because I didn't teach you how to calm your emotions. And you were so angry. You were so angry at authority figures because I, the chief authority figure, the chief parent, was not always there. I, who could have, who could have spent more time with you, but I couldn't because I did. I caused a percentage of your anger, which made it possible for you to hate authority figures, which, which was the motivating factor. And what type of behavior you displayed towards the officer that made this officer take on this otherwise illegal action. I am the reason for your anger. Now, other stuff that you did throughout your childhood and your adolescence, yeah, that's, that's you. But, but I could have been a part of that spark that put more gasoline on the flame. We're not going to have that conversation. We're not going to have that conversation. Because it's got to be somebody else's fault. So how can I be a better me? So I can help you be a better you. So then you can calm down and think about this officer who you're dealing with. Think about the fact that you probably, probably, probably assumed things about this officer that just was not true. You assumed this officer was a racist solely on the basis of his skin color without any uh, regard to his actions or the lack thereof. What are you going to be honest about that? This officer hadn't done anything to qualify being called a racist, but you called him a racist because you're thinking about Mike Brown. You're thinking about Sandra Bland. You're thinking about this other person. And without any regard to what this specific officer did, you judge this officer on the basis of their skin color and their occupation without any regard to any display of behavior. And you acted on that assumption, which exacerbated an already messed up situation because this officer, who is also a human could have come from a horrible childhood, could have never had any experience with any black person, could have been their first traffic stop. And in that first traffic stop, whatever they might have thought about black people being negative, your actions because of your misunderstanding about the human element in this situation could have been what made worse that situation and caused them to use illegal use of force under the influence of emotions that police officers also feel Two. Could have just had a bad argument with his wife and now you going to come at me and treat me with disrespect? Not a reason to use that level of force, but it definitely happens. Oh, I'm going to show this mother. You could be the agent of change. The change could be within you. But you don't recognize your power of influence. You don't recognize the opportunity that you have to, through your just simple calm demeanor, your calm demeanor and how you act could be the lesson this officer needs to learn. Officers, your understanding, not acceptance, but your understanding of the feelings that the black community may feel towards the police, not necessarily because of you, but because of the actions that police in the past have done toward the black community 
for no reason other than skin color. Your understanding, not acceptance, but your understanding of those apprehensions that motivate the behavior. I understand why you said, man, F12. Okay, I understand. I'm not going to get mad. I didn't do it to you. I didn't do it, right? That's just like me coming off and saying, man, F like, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. I can't do that. Let's have a conversation. I got you wanting to stop. Let's talk. I'm not in a rush, right? Let's talk. Let me see your driver's license, proof of insurance. Let me check out everything is okay. Right? If we check out everything is okay, we can have a conversation. Because this is a time for me to educate you. And I want to learn from you too. We forget how to be humans. We forget the human experience. It's so much my position, my position, my position, my position, my background, where I'm from, where I'm from. We don't bother to have any kind of empathy. We don't bother to have any kind of empathy. Empathy for the person that you're stopping. Empathy for yourself because you want to make it home. Maybe if we were more humans instead of titles. Maybe if we were more humans instead of titles. Maybe we could actually get somewhere. Right? Don't talk about I know my rights and you don't know the Fourth Amendment. Don't talk about, I know my rights and this officer didn't tell me why they stopped me. The Fourth Amendment does not state they have to tell you. The Fourth Amendment states they have to have a reason and they have to be able to articulate that reason to a judge. That's the, that's the law. So in order for you to reverse course, how about a constitutional convention to change the Fourth Amendment to add that a reason should be told to the person? Will it happen? Eh, who knows, right? But learn the system. You don't have to accept it. Learn the system, right? Terry versus Ohio. That's the standard of reasonable suspicion, 392 U.S. 1. Brenninger versus United States, 338 U.S. 160, 1949. That's the standard of probable cause. Understand that the police's job is not to find evidence that is proof beyond a reasonable doubt, that's the courts. The threshold, the stopping point for the police is probable cause. Brenninger versus United States. So why am I going to argue a proof beyond a reasonable doubt in the car when that's not the theater for that argument? Everything has a time and a place. Everything. Everything. In my children's book, what I tell myself first, children's real world affirmations of self-esteem. I even put that in the book. I must wait until the right time to do things. I must wait until the right time to do things. I must speak when it's time. I must speak what is mine. Your rights are yours. The right time to do it may not be now. But when it's time, I must speak what is mine. But I have to know and have knowledge of what is mine so that when I speak out, they don't look at me as a fool. They look at me as someone to be heard. I wish I could say it differently. I can't. Somebody needed to hear this. Thank you. I'm just telling you. Those of you all who are parents who will backhand your kid into the mouth. Pop! I ain't tell you to talk, son. This ain't the time for you to talk. This is the time for you to listen. And then I'm going to open up the door and the floor for questions. Because I want to learn from you. I want to know. See, you beat your kids when you have things to teach your kids. And you beat because you yourself were beat and not taught. And oh, the irony when you want to stand up and say, we have the right to be free from police brutality. 
but you are brutal in your homes towards your kids because life was brutal toward you. And so you return that brutality with just a hint of niceness. Oh, that pen drop moment. It, it, this must have been the right time to talk because I've got 175 people that, uh, oh, Kathy, thank you. Thank you. This must have been the right time to talk. Sometimes I go live in the morning. Sometimes I don't. Right. You know, and all that getting, get an understanding. You can't get an understanding with all these emotions. And you can't teach understanding to people when you yourself don't understand. You can't. There can't just be one side to this. <laughs> Kitty, you silly. There can't just be one side to this. There's multiple sides. There's multiple sides. Actually, three. One side, the other side, and then the truth. But you get it, right? Systemic racism. First of all, the system is people. Racism is an ism. And isms are harbored and pushed by people. So if you don't attack the issues that motivate people, you're going to have the systemic and the ism of race, the ism of sex, the ism of patriot, the ism of terror, the isms, isms, isms are ideologies. Isms are motivations. What motivates you? We get to the point where we're angry at the presence of what was the motivation. But then we don't look at what the motivation was to change the presentation. So what motivates you? I am a police officer. You are going to speak to me with respect. Wait a minute. Calm down. <laughs> Why are you so angry? First of all, respect is a feeling. And if you speak, <laughs> Kitty, <you> stop. <laughs> Cord. Respect is a feeling. And if you respect yourself, by knowing the truth about yourself and where you could be deficient, no one can disrespect you. No one can take that power, that respect away from you so that a person can say all they want to say and you can never be disrespected. Now I got to be motivated by something else in order to do something I'm not supposed to be doing. Right? People in the hood sometimes shoot each other on this thing of disrespect. People in the police department will sometimes arrest you because they felt disrespected. It's the same thing on both sides. And what's the common factor? The human element. The human element. Oh, you're a police officer. You're wearing a nice, you're wearing a nice uniform with a shiny star or a shiny shield. You had to have come from a good home. No, that's not always the case. Some people become police officers because of the shitty home they came from. <laughs> and here we go. Anything that that police officer has not fixed on the inside that they've built up a wall around, being a police officer is a tougher wall. So now that issue which still lies in there could serve as the motivation for why they treat you the way they treat you. And then the issues that you don't take care of within you are the same thing. So you can't be the agent of that which you have not changed. You cannot be the agent of that which you have not changed within you first. I can't deliver to you this speech or this statement if I don't recognize what resides within me that motivates me to feel some kind of way that I feel. I can't tell you and have great confidence if you understand Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I can't have self-esteem if I'm insecure 
that I'm insecure by my ignorance of a subject matter I should be, <laughs> oh my God, a subject matter. My ancestors, black folks, African folks, those who cannot speak the English language and then came over, brought over, brought over, right? And then were made to learn the English language, were subjected to all kinds of torture, so that I can have the right of access to what I am subjected to now. I owe them a service to understand me, to understand life, to understand all of these things so that I can be the agents of change. But if I don't understand me and I go around and I'm emotional, rightfully so, your emotions are right. Oh my God, you have the right to be angry. And when you are mistreated, you have the right to be angry and demand that a person treats you with respect. But you also have the right to understand that respect is a feeling and you're not going to always get it. And that's okay. It's not okay for a person to physically treat you any kind of way. But how they feel about you prior to that treatment, I couldn't care less because if you respect yourself first, then your oh Lord, I used to love it later on in my police career when somebody used to say, man, you fat with a badge at the police. I'd be like, OK, yeah, I, I probably gained a little bit of weight. You're right. I, I, you're probably right. I should stop eating the donuts. That's number one. Uh, number two, um, I'm not all the police. I'm just Mike Brown. So why wow, we got to F all the police when all the police not here? It's just me. And then when you turn that situation into a comedy situation, right? Because you're not in your feelings and you can see that they are angry at the institution you represent and not you yourself because they don't know you. Now we can better deal with that situation instead of being disrespected by it. You got to have confidence within yourself. You got to have confidence within yourself, but you can't have that confidence if you got issues within you that have not been worked that have not been worked on. And the thing is, the police academy, I don't care what kind of policies they change. They're, they're not going to deal with those inner issues within that officer. No matter how many uh, protests you go out there and, and deal or, or be a part of. Right. No matter how many things you throw at the cops. No matter how many buildings you burn down, it's not going to deal with the issues that reside within you. Martin Luther King Jr. is known for saying this. In April of 1968, he went down to Memphis, Tennessee for the sanitation workers uh, strike. Okay, And rioting happened as a result of some of the other actions and that that took place within that time. And Martin Luther King was interviewed uh, and, you know, is there something that we could do to bring about the, you know, the, the rioting or whatnot to, to go ahead and bring it down? And what did he say? Rioting is the language of the unheard. And you might have heard that statement used more so incorrectly, but correctly, depending upon your side of the issue throughout these riots that occurred nationwide. Not really nationwide in Democrat towns where they just let stuff happen. Yeah, I said it. Shh. Anyway. But there's another aspect to that that is not traveled. If rioting is the language of the unheard and we look at the demographics of those who were out there doing the rioting, most of them were the young and close to middle age, if not middle aged folk. Who were also shh, unheard. Unheard by who? Unheard by this justice system that just wants to oppress. Okay, we can argue that too. But you know who they were also unheard by? Their parents. The parent that put that young person on ADHD medication. The parent that put that person out the house. Yeah. 
Because you thought you were being disrespected because this young person took a stand against your wrongful actions as a parent. And you're going to listen to what I have to say. There's the finger of resolute again. You're going to listen to what I have to say or I'm going to put you out because it's my rules, my house, my way. Because you're never wrong as a parent, right? So why should I care about authority when the chief authority figure in my house doesn't care about me? That's also unheard too. Shh. Yeah. Well, we didn't think about that. I know you were too busy worried about the police. La policia. Polizai. You were too busy worried about that. You didn't focus on where true authority and understanding of systems lie. It lies within the household first, right? Even in the military, when you get into basic training, boot camp, MT, whatever you want to call it, right? The drill instructors, the drill sergeants, the, the, the Coast Guard training instructors, they're, they're hard. Oh, they get in you because they got to break you down and get you to work as a team because you come from different walks of life and you have to understand what you're about to undertake. And then at some point in the training, they become human again where they then begin to talk to you and teach you because you are now teachable. 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 Yeah. Teachable. I can teach you now because your mind is open. Because I've broken you down to a position where you understand about this subject matter. As Socrates said, I know this that I know nothing. And there is the portal through which information can be received. Can be received. But if you're so bent and you're so angry, you're in the amygdala, that part of the brain that controls fight, flight, freeze, and emotions. Your prefrontal cortex isn't even open and receptive to any kind of debate, any kind of logic. You just don't care because you have theory fixation bias. And that's what I feel that this Chicago 21 working crew, whomever, that's what I feel they are going to do. They have theories and they are only going to look at and for the evidence that supports their theory, not the whole thing. This 21 group of people who are coming from all walks of life. Yeah, all walks of life with the same theory. You probably have no one in that group that has a different theory. And so you're only going to look for the evidence that supports that theory. When we don't have honesty on both sides, there can be no reform. Then Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger said it best at the time where former uh, Los Angeles gang based uh, uh, crypt leader Stanley Tukey Williams, when he was right there about to be executed when there was a temporary stay of execution so that the governor can look at the petition to decide whether or not his sentence of death should be commuted to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Tukey Williams was talking about all of the reforms and redemption and books that he wrote and his speeches that he made to try to sway people away from gang violence. And Arnold Schwarzenegger was just curious about the one thing. Well, did you do what you were convicted of? And Stanley Tukey Williams maintained what he stated was his innocence at the time. No, I didn't do that. The evidence didn't support that. The evidence supported that he did it, even though he said he didn't do it. And Governor Schwarzenegger said it best. Well, you're, and I'm paraphrasing, well, all this talk of redemption how can you have redemption without an admission of guilt? What are we redeeming you from? And of course, you can be redeemed from a life of, you know, negativity. But in this instance, not having done this thing, I understand that aspect of the argument, too. 
But what about the victims you harmed? Did you do it? I mean, after all, he wasn't trying to set you free. He was only going to give you life in prison without the possibility of parole. You weren't going anywhere, right? And then the other part of that was he could have said, oh, you did it. We're definitely going to punish you now. Could go either way. What did you have to lose? Well, your life, apparently, because you died on your position that you were innocent. At some point in time, there has to be some honesty deep within inside that says, yeah, I did mess this up. I did. And it hurts. It hurts me. It hurts you. I did. And perhaps that puts you on a road that motivated why this happened. Doesn't excuse what happened. But we definitely need to attack this motivation. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Um, Y'all do me a favor. Go to Amazon, go to, you know, this book, What I Tell Myself First, Children's Real World Affirmations of Self-Esteem. It's only $1.99. Buy it, download the Kindle app, start to read it to your kids every day. Why do I say read this? Take my name off of it. You can go on ahead and scratch your name on it and say you wrote it. But read it to your kids every day. You can add words or take away certain things that fit your belief systems. Sure, why not go ahead? But we need to start instilling within our kids things that help them build their self-esteem. Because you cannot, you cannot be mad at just the police. Look, you need to instill and help them reach their self-esteem. Your child could be the next police officer that could do something wrongfully to another person. Or your child could be the next police officer who could be the instrument of change. Your child could be the next business leader, business owner, entrepreneur, lawyer, doctor, basketball player, whatever you want to be. Your child can reach these levels of self-actualization within life for whatever they want to be if they have positive self-esteem. Add stuff to it. I don't care. Get them started on something. Get them started on something. Some kind of regimen. Yes, you can. Get them some kind of regimen. It's only $2. Uh, you about to go out and mess up $2 today doing something else. I've, seen, I've received so many testimonies of how the book has helped people's kids. And the book is not just for kids. The book is for you too. Because there's some things in that book that we need to learn as adults. I am no good to anyone else if I'm not good to myself. I must do for myself first. I must protect myself first. How many of us give so much of ourselves to other people and get used every day? And then we don't give to ourselves. I'm just saying. We, we got to do it. We got to do it. We got to start working on the human condition because that's where all this stuff comes from. The human condition. No one person is better than the other. You might have done things better than the other, but that's that thing. But no one person is better than the other. Right? I thank y'all for tuning in. This was a long little lecture, but y'all hung in. Ooh, that, that number up there of people watching was, y'all maintained that for sure. Okay. All right, I'm going to get out of here. Um, when I go live, will you come back? Because I got more to teach. I was supposed to be teaching you about your criminal justice rights, but then we spawned off, we, we went off into this segment, which was greatly needed. It was greatly needed for sure. But I'm going to do another video about your rights because I want you to understand you got the Fourth Amendment, you got Terry versus Ohio, you got, uh, 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 what's that, Bur uh, Brigham versus United States. You got all these other different things. I want this to be your college. Some of you may not go to college, right? You may not have access to this information. I mean, you got access to it, right? But you may not, something needs to inflame your passions to learn it so that you can learn how to better navigate it. You could be the person that could teach a police officer something they may have forgotten, something they didn't know. Because they definitely don't know. So, boy, I'm tell you, that's another topic right there. That's another topic right there. What they don't know, right? I'm just saying it's both sides. It's both sides. We got to be honest. We got to be honest. I love y'all. Let me get out of here. Got to get to the range. Get to somebody's concealed carry classes. No one's job to protect you but you. If you're in Chicago and you want concealed carry, inbox me. 
Be patient, please. I'm so busy. I will get back to you. I promise I will. I promise I will. Promise, promise, promise. I love you guys. Stay safe. Have a great day. You say as long as I don't sugarcoat, I'm going to have an audience. JJ, when have I ever been known to sugarcoat stuff? Get at me. <laughs>